So, <coughs> I believe it's myself and my student who will be presenting now, actually. She is not supposed to present, but that's the case. Here, by the way. Well, okay, so great to see you here. Um, I thank you, Mitrios and um, Jay Hong, and obviously Federico, who's not here, for organizing this workshop um, and teaming up with, with me as well for organization. Um, and uh, so we, uh, we started focusing uh, on sensing just a few years ago uh, and uh, in, in kind of uh, uh, exotic ways, or at least uh, the first part of the talk. So I'll talk about uh, that first, about uh, how could we send what I call whole body, colli uh, whole body collisions um, in, in robotic systems. And in this case, we'll present for mobile platforms, moving platforms, uh, how can we detect any interaction with a human. And my student will uh, present then post estimation for point foot robots, which um, we have to uh, exploit any sensing information possible in order to get the best readings uh, that we can. Since point for walking is very quick, actually point for walking is, uh, has a frequency of well, two steps per second. It's very important to have a, a clean uh, post estimation. So we started building mobile platforms like this one uh, a few years ago, and actually it was done uh, as an education, educational project. We had high school students, and then we had undergrads, and all sorts of, of, uh, of personnel. And slowly, slowly, we started increasing the quality um, among the things that we did is to remove backlash, so we redesigned the, uh, the drivetrain uh, using belt drives, and ultimately we switched to harmonic drives instead of um, uh, um, uh, planetary gears in order to provide quality force control. Uh, another property of this basic, we have a, um, an Omega TQ513 uh, torque control, torque shaft controller. It is one of the only bases you will see out there with a rotary torque control, and that allows us to have a sensing modality for detecting any interaction uh, with people. It also has an AMU, but unfortunately we haven't done central fusion with the, with the AMU yet. And it has these omni wheels as well that are typical from the hobbyist uh, communities. Using rigid body assumptions, we formulate uh, the second order uh, dynamics of the robot's body, including the two degree of freedom trans translations and one degree of freedom uh, rotation. And here, lambda c corresponds to the traction moments, um, which I divided. Part of it is the thrust of the wheel, but part of it is also the traction of the opni roller. So these really small opni rollers on the side, we also model them. And I'll say now why it's, why it's quite important. The additional force external is the interaction with uh, with uh, with person or with uh, an object uh, on the ground. We then formulate second order dynamics for, uh, for the wheels that are dependent on the thrust of the wheels. And then we also formulate the second order dynamics of the rollers, but the rollers, they don't have uh, bearing. They don't have mechanical bearing, and, have, and therefore they have very, uh, very high friction. And therefore, what is important in this equation is to, is to um, capture the effect of the roller uh, friction and remove it for uh, the post estimation. Um, yeah, that's it. So our goal is to detect collision, the collision range using the previous uh, dynamic model. And we do so by performing inverse dynamics and some uh, clean tricks uh, to find a solution of the contact range. So here we are inver inverting, and then we're obtaining this, uh, uh, this partial solution. Uh, we have five unknowns, uh, but we have only three equations. But we make an assumption that the collisions happen, happen on the outskirts of the body, of the mobile base. And therefore, there is an interdependency between, between the x and y direction by the radius of the base. We also make an assumption that we always make pushing forces, and therefore we are not generating torques. The torques, that we, the torques, the moments that we generate are equal to zero, and with that we reduce the dimensionality to three unknowns with three equations we now can solve for the, uh, for the contact forces. Uh, we ignore the wheel accelerations and the uh, roller accelerations because the inertia is very small, and for the accelerations of the, of the body, 
we use actually the desired trajectories, assuming that we have a, a good uh, position controller of the, of the base, which, um, at least in free space, is probably correct. So to, to accomplish the previous estimation, um, we need to know the role of friction, as we, uh, we talked before, because friction is pretty high. And uh, to do so, we perform an identification process. What we do is we apply torque, we apply um, a command, sinusoidal command of moving back and forth, position command of one of the wheels, and then we measure torques in the other two wheels. Uh, sometimes we apply uh, sinusoidal commands to two of the wheels and then measure on the remaining wheel. And that's the profile that we get for the torques on the passive wheel. We get this kind of a square wave. Um, most of it is due to stiction and not dynamic friction. And therefore, it's fairly easy to model using a, a hyperbolic uh, tangent function. And finally, we have here estimated versus uh, sorry, real versus estimated uh, water frictions. And you can see that they are also quite influential. So all of this is in the name uh, in, of using the previous dynamical models, remove as much as possible of known data um, from the estimation processes and also from the second order dynamics. And then everything that is remaining, it must be the external forces, as we saw earlier on. So how, how good is it performing? So for that, we build kind of a calibrated test bed. It consists of a pulley system with a, a weight falling with gravity. This is for having the least variability possible. And then we have a stick with, a, a, with an inertia that, that hits the robot as a constant acceleration uh, or with a constant force. We also experiment with different uh, constructs for collisions, which can be either a rigid contact, we call it a rigid bumper, but we can also attach a spring uh, but the spring, obviously, is going to reduce the possibility, the reaction of the mobile platform is, is going to reduce the timing. So what we do is we attach a clutch, it's a magnetic clutch. And the magnetic clutch gives an impact at the, the initial contact time, and then this engages and it provides a level of safety. Okay? And that goes, it's kind of um, half-baked research, but we can envision uh, mobile bases not only having these contact capabilities for sensing kind of contact awareness all over the body, but we can also imagine having them bumpers. And those bumpers, in one hand, they provide safety, but they also decrease the ability of the base of, um, of reacting quickly. And therefore, having a clutch, it gives you the best of the world, both worlds. It gives you a quick impact. All the sensors in the body react right away, base moves away, but then the, the spring allows you to uh, uh, provide a level of safety and reaction time. Um, so to test the, the whole body contact sensing capabilities, we apply forces to all sides of the platform. So here we see a platform, we rotate it in different ways, put it in front of the test dummy, and then we launch it with a given force. And then we can see um, some of our charts we here. In here we see the, the contact forces in the different directions. We're actually providing the same uh, forces, I think about uh, 10 newtons. So we have some variability, but relatively uh, high fidelity measurements. And then in the uh, lower chart here, we see the, the direction of the contact that we detect uh, with respect to the real one. To do that, we actually put uh, markers in both the dummy and also on the mobile base. And then we can have ground truth uh, with respect to the estimated uh, the measurements and, uh, and as well as the, the orientation of the estimation. So location and orientation. So how, how good we are doing? Uh, magnitude suffers from up to 46% error but an average error of 30%. Location suffers from a maximum of uh, 11 centimeters, but average uh, error of four centimeters, and direction has an average error of seven degrees. So it's pretty, pretty good for uh, being kind of uh, relatively primary to work. Our technique for safety is to implement a high impedance PID controller while freely moving. And this is a complete departure from what many people do. What many people do is a low impedance controller such that uh, when you react, uh, you're gonna already going to be in low impedance. But instead, what we decide to do is have high impedance, so we can track the trajectories very precisely. But then up on impact, we quickly switch to an emittance controller. And that emittance controller, it implements a low impedance. Okay? So it's more important how quickly you detect your contact and how quickly you can switch the controller in order to provide a level of safety. We start with a given desired impedance profile up there, which is with respect to the desired response to the external forces. And obviously, these impedances, if you want safety, they have to be small. In other words, when you, when you contact, you want your base to move as quickly as possible uh, away. 
And that can be integrated, and we can obtain a, a close form solution of the trajectories of the base in order to produce that desired impedance. Uh, and now, using forward kinematics, we can actually calculate the velocities of the wheels, and then we have an impedance control on the wheels to produce the torques or the currents that will deliver uh, that desired impedance. So, pretty straightforward. For experimentation, we reuse the calibrated collision dummy that we saw earlier on. Uh, in particular, the magnet, uh, magnetic catch clutch allows us to detect quick impact, uh, but then comply to allow us more time for, uh, for safety. We first collide the dummy on the upper part of the robot, up here, instead of the lower part. And then we collide from a stop position, so the base is not moving. And that's considered a more difficult scenario than if the base is moving. So it is moving, you're, you know where you're going, so you can always return to the path you were having before. But in this case, you don't know, you're kind of blind. You just receive a collision, depending where it comes, you have to react, you have to detect the collision uh, precisely. It takes 45 milliseconds to detect the collision. And uh, in part, it's due to the structure of the base. It's not completely rigid, so the propagation of the forces until it arrives to the contact sensors, it takes some time. Uh, but also because we use a con conservative detection of the threshold. And here we can see impact zero. We see the uh, detection of contact forces. They're starting to go up, and by a certain point, the threshold kicks in, and then we decide that this is an external collision uh, based on the model. And we could have a less conservative, and then we'll have better response but then it's more sensitive to, to kind of um, random responses, uh, unwanted responses. It takes then another 50 milliseconds to respond. This is a detection here, and then about over here, 100 milliseconds, you are already responding. Um, and then this is due mostly to, due to the harmonic drives. Harmonic drives, as you guys know, are pretty soft, and then it takes time. So this tells us quite a bit of information. It takes us 100 milliseconds to react. This is by no means safe. You don't want to be colliding against robots that takes 100 milliseconds. You won't colliding against robots that takes like two milliseconds to respond, right? Um, so for that, future generations of robotic systems, they will have to have very stiff, in my opinion, very stiff drivetrains, incredibly quick um, uh, uh, estimation processes, and only that way, they can right away disappear from your site as soon as you collide. Very interesting area. We also experimented with collisions when the base is moving towards the, uh, the dummy, it takes 100 milliseconds for the collision, and then uh, again, 50 milliseconds to respond. The reason why it takes longer to uh, detect the collision is because the robot is moving slower, and therefore, uh, it takes the impact is uh, less pronounced. Okay, so it's also depending on the impact velocity. We also let the base uh, lose around, colliding against uh, people, and then I think what is important especially meaningful is this kind of collisions. You hear Kenan, one of my students, putting the hand on the wheel. Now, there is no skin whatsoever, but the, uh, the, the really the, the estimator is agnostic to where the collisions occur. So they can occur in the wheel itself. And collisions in the wheel are very important because a lot of them happen you know, on your feet, for instance. Uh, so you don't wanna only detect collisions around the body, but also on the wheel, uh, but also biking, sitting down, and this is kind of the, the world that we envision, this robotic world where robots are moving right next to the human. The takeaway message is that we need methods that can be aware of collisions anywhere, any point of the robot. We have exploited, in this case, these three uh, torque sensors, but you could exploit also IMUs, vibration sensors, uh, anything that you have available. A low impedance control before collisions um, take place, uh, maybe not the way to go. Maybe you want to have high stiffness controllers and then switch very very quickly to low, uh, low impedance controllers. And it is better to rely on very quick collisions. Okay? The detection of collisions very quickly. And finally, this is a movie. And this work was published, by the way, in Autonomous Robots recently. So we use different bumpers. The first one is a, is a rigid bumper. And we can see here the 100 milliseconds it takes to detect the direction and respond to it. In the bumper with a spring. And finally, the spring with a clutch. So this one provides this kind of uh, uh, additional room for responding for safety. Uh, but they should be quicker for the detection. And it's a little bit quicker, it's not as traumatic as I thought, 
And then we do the same thing for any, any place around the body. And you can see here the very quick reaction. As soon as it, you, know, you, wanna, you want your robot to just disappear from your side, as soon as it makes collision. Is a collision with the hand, so it has knowledge of collisions anywhere, any direction. Very sensitive to anything. Okay, so this concludes the first part of the talk, and now we're going to switch to uh, uh, Don Kuhn, who will be talking about a completely different topic, about the estimation of uh, point foot, um, uh, post estimation for point foot uh, robots. And uh, I was very impressed by the talk of, um, of Ludon. So I think we have a little bit more primitive uh, sensing, but the modality includes motion capture data as well. Okay, uh, let me explain the uh, sensing process of the point foot bipeds, especially how we get the orientation of the robot's body. This is our sensing systems. We have an IMU, joint encoder, and motion capture systems. The red LED you can see in this picture is the uh, vision marker. So our system is the point of a bike robot, so which is under actuated system, and they have to play with a jerk from the sudden contact change and the disturbance from the dynamic motions. So it is clear we need the clean and accurate orientation data. Uh, so we are using the IMG sensors for pose estimating. Mm. The IMU we have is the one on the left. And we are comparing this to this with a high performance IMU, which is one in um, right. So in this state of so the, this specification show that uh, almost the 400 times better, the, I mean the KVH is the almost 400 times better than the ours, uh, but still, we need a clear data, so we enhance the limited, limited performance by using the motion capture system. Uh, let's start from the how we define the, our problems. So this is the reference point of the each LED, and then we can think the translation and rotation of the body is the alignment between the, this reference and measure the LED data. And what we want to find is the orientation matrix. When we see the one law of the opine map, we can see that this linear equation, which means that we can reformulate this opine map to the linear uh, functions. So theta is the translation and vectorized the orientation matrix, and R includes the reference position of the LED, but uh, in this matrix uh, so present uh, uh, linear equations we just saw. So it looks like it is okay to take the, just the pseudo inverse of the, uh, these linear equations, but we need to think about uh, how to handle the LED occlusions and uh, how to mix this with uh, IMU data and how to handle the substantial delay in motion Let's start from the how to handle the occlusions. The idea is simple. If the, uh, there is a missing LED, then we just uh, remove the rows associated with the missing LED. 
when we write them, writing down is in matrix forms, then we will get uh, this matrix. The K0 is selection matrix, and to be proper, we multiply this selection matrix with the identity matrix uh, <coughs> component wise. This is the transformation we just saw before. Okay, let's talk about the how to mix this with the IU data. This is the timelines of our systems. This small slot corresponds to the server rate, and this large slot corresponds to the motion capture system's update rate. Since the motion capture system's update rate is slower than the server rate, when we get the new sensor data, new motion capture data, we also have the several uh, data, new data points from the IMU. So we can use this another information, which is consists of the uh, previous estimation plus integration of the INU's angular velocity data. So let's decode the previous equations, and uh, we have uh, this another information from the INU. We put it in the single matrix forms, then we can achieve the sensor fusion. Almost done. So we take the weighted pseudo inverse, uh, inverse in this uh, with this matrix, and the weight is decided based on the, our uh, belief preference. The last step is to find the closest quaternion. The method we are using is in this paper. Uh, let me sum up to, to introduce, explain the, how this estimator is. Uh, working in real time operation. So, controller basically can ask the orientations whenever it needs. Then, the orientation estimator returns this value, which is the consists of the uh, latest <coughs> orientation estimation plus integration of the angular velocity. Do the same things in every step, but when we have a new LED data, then we put it in the black position. We already know that this is not about the this time because of the this amount of the latency. And then execute the estimation process, which we saw. The, uh, the last thing is to update the orientation estimations with uh, this the latest estimated data estimation. This is experiment result. So in this unsupported balance mode test, we use the orientation estimate estimator I explained. So we achieved the 18 steps. So we plan to we have uh, many things in our list to enhance the stability and the number of the steps. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, the, the question for the first speaker. So you mentioned the 100 milliseconds delay until uh, the collision is detected. Uh, do you think the uh, neglectance of uh, the acceleration could be a problem because especially uh, when a collision there should be a very strong acceleration in the wheels on the platform. Well, that's a good point. Um, it could be a good point. Yes, we. I don't think uh, we have dig, dig uh, far enough into all the possible causes, but uh, it, it makes sense what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. Adding to this, uh, so you reshape the inverse dynamics to calculate the external forces. So you could try um, a generalized momentum based service observer and use by the Luca. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. To possibly include the velocity and therefore give a quicker reaction. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for the for, for the for the prompt. I think that there is there is uh, in here we really we shoot for uh, a new capability that we didn't we didn't see it was missing. Uh, around which is the ability of mobile platforms to kind of react very quickly 
and move away and have uh, contact awareness. And uh, I think there is a lot of room for kind of the quintessential um, uh, safe robot, right? What is, in what ways we're going to optimize every single component, the reaction, the sensing, uh, and, and there is where we, we're going to need uh, additional help on, on estimation. Um, but thank you, thank you for the comments. Any more questions? How about different surfaces? In different surfaces, that's a good point. So you're going to have traction, traction differences. Right. Yeah, yeah. You have to adjust your planes. Yes. You, so you, you can see that um, the the base actually was doing a wheelie. When you hit it, it, it already lifts up, right? Uh, probably, if you, uh, and the uh, and speed is slippery. Uh, so you have a more uh, less slippery uh, surface. Probably you're gonna you might you might you might you might tilt. So what is the limit of reaction of a of a base? Is the the surface the moments you can generate, uh, the moment the angular momentum you can generate, and uh, and also the the all the internal mechanisms. So I think that uh, you know you think about it. Uh, one of the areas I'm going to address is if you have a car like a um, mid-sized car and then it's colliding with the person and reacts. You know because of the of the weight and the inertia, you need to have huge motors, right? And then also you need to, you need to make sure that you you're not going to kind of you know, flipping, flipping over. But all these considerations are very important. Thanks for putting them up. All right, so uh, thank you. We're gonna switch now to uh, Jehon Park. So please, go ahead. When you are switching, when you are using, uh, what's it? You are not using uh, biped, but point feet, biped. Um, it's an academic, it's a very academic, uh, so uh, uh, first, first of all, they are uh, easier to, to build, they have less degrees of freedom, 